Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. At the uh, Real Science Exchange, we like to say that uh, we we meet in a virtual pub with real drinks. Typically, we are uh, meeting uh, on a screen. We see each other on a screen, but tonight that's not the case. We try to recreate the atmosphere that takes place after a scientific conference. Um, that takes place in the pub over a few drinks with uh, good friends and colleagues. But tonight we don't have to uh, pretend. We're actually after a real science conference, so that's awesome. Uh, and with friends and colleagues. So we're looking for a, uh, a rousing uh, discussion tonight. We even have an audience looking forward to having some discussions and, and questions from them as well. would encourage them to participate. Um, I mentioned that we are at the Tri-State Nutri Nutrition Conference where we just had a uh, a symposia on exploring in utero influences on transgenerational performance. And with us tonight with our panel, first we have uh, Dr. Jack Britt. Jack, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and then what are you drinking tonight? Well, I'm drinking whiskey. Uh, I'm a retired professor. I worked at Michigan State University and at North Carolina State University and also the University of Tennessee. My specialty is dairy cattle reproduction and management, and I have a future team that looks at the dairy industry 50 years in the future. Now, um, I forgot to mention that your title for your talk today was Epigenetics Will Change How We Manage Cattle. Uh, also to my uh, right here is uh, Dr. Humana Leporta, um, and your topic was yeah, phenotypic and, and molecular signatures of fetal hypothermia. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking a fruity cocktail, which is really good. I recommend it. Um, I'm Jimena Laporta. I am an assistant professor. I'm not retired yet. I'm an assistant professor in lactation physiology. Started my career at the University of Florida. Uh, spent there five years, and now, um, shy of two years, I have been in, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I noticed before you had a whiskey old-fashioned. What happened with that? Is it just wasn't to your liking? It wasn't brandy, so uh, had right. to pass. Oh, there you Sorry. Go. Brian, we need to fix the next one. All right, and to my left, my trusty uh, and talented co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Clay, tell us a little about yourself and what are you uh, drinking tonight? So I'm the um, director of technical services uh, for Bowcom's Animal Nutrition and Health uh, Division. And I'm I'm drinking a a captain and diet tonight. Awesome, sounds good. No uh, uh, cider this time. They they didn't have they any didn't hard have cider. Any, okay. No yeah. angry orchard. No angry clay. All right, got it. Very well. I forgot to mention clay that your title uh, the talk uh, was prenatal choline supplementation's role in calf performance. Uh, next speaker is um, Dr. Eric um, Capio. No, Capio. 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 All right, and, and your talk is a little bit different. It's, it's not uh, anything to do with dairy science, but the growing importance of choline in prenatal human nutrition. It's very interesting. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then what are you drinking tonight? Sure. My name is uh, Eric Capio. I'm uh, part of the nutrition science team here at Belchem on the human nutrition side. Uh, I am drinking a Diet Coke, and the reason I'm doing that is because my wife is actually pregnant in preparation for today's <laughs> talk. I think she was being very supportive. <laughs> and uh, so I have uh, made her the solemn promise that I will also abstain from drinking throughout the course oh, of the pregnancy. Oh, very nice. Very the, nice. Uh, you know, Team Capio. Yeah, she is on choline, though. Yes, she is. <laughs> yeah, copious amounts. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> All right. And then our final speaker was uh, Dr. Pete Hansen. He had methyl donors and epigenetic regulation of the early embryo. Pete, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then what are you drinking tonight? Yeah, hi. I'm a professor of uh, animal reproduction at the University of Florida, Department of Animal Science, where I've been there 38 years. So I'm drinking whiskey. Uh, I've got a whiskey as well, uh, Buffalo Trace. I think, you know, I heard, uh, well, actually, Jack and I had a couple of Buffalo Traces last night. That's in right. We were practicing for this today, right? That's what we were doing. <laughs> so when I heard him order that again, I had to have it as well. Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. 
Visit Balchem.com to learn more. So, again, the uh, conference today was uh, titled Exploring In Utero Influences on Transgenerational Performance. Jack, I'm going to ask you the first question since you started us off today, but you mentioned that cows represent three generations. Can you talk a little bit about that and implications it has for dairy production? Sure. When we look at a cow that's pregnant, uh, we think about the cow as being one generation and the calf in utero being the second generation. But that calf in utero also has ovaries or testes, and they have the germ cells for the third generation. So when we're managing a herd, if the cow's pregnant, we're actually managing the next three generations all at the same time. And so we have to have a long look in terms of how those animals are going to be cared for and fed and what kind of nutrients they receive in order for them to be healthy and productive. Excellent. You know, I really enjoyed your presentation. I really like the story that you told about your twin brother. So maybe you could kind of recount that story again. Yes, I'm a twin, and twins are alike, identically, genetically. And if we look at their DNA, the methylation or the changes in the DNA that may occur, uh, they're absolutely the same until they're move until they move apart from each other. At three years of age, the DNA is exactly the same. At 55 years of age, uh, that I use to compare with my brother, uh, if you look at the DNA and the methylation on the DNA, it's different, significantly different among twins because their environment that they lived in over the time they've been apart has a significant effect on how their DNA functions. And I think that's a very important uh, concept that we really don't understand very well. Now, during our pregame discussions, you had a, uh, <clears throat> a very interesting question for uh, Dr. Hansen. Do you want to ask that one again? Uh, we asked about splitting embryos and if, they w- if we could make twins. And with, the, with those two embryos, if the two cell was split into twins, would they develop the same? Right. Thank you, Jack, for that question. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, certainly we've been splitting embryos since the 60s and splitting cow embryos since the 80s. But I think our appreciation of epigenetics is much more recent, so as people didn't really think about it. And if I was to guess, I would say they won't be They'll certainly be genetically identical, but there's some evidence that even as early as the two-cell stage, one of the cells of the embryo has inherited a different set of messenger RNAs from the egg as the other cell. So it's likely that they would have a slightly different epigenetic history once they started developing. And I wouldn't be surprised, but epigenetically they were not identical it would be a very good experiment well it's it's really the same as looking at young twins who are identical right and then looking at the same twins when they're 50 years old and they're always different right at 50 years and always the same at two or three years so yeah they they, they probably be the same kind of uh, changes there yeah uh, carrie do we have any questions in the audience hey mark fox uh, dairy vet in Thelma, michigan for 38 years, too, and you are just like your twin brother, so, <laughs> Jack, it's awesome to have you. Thank you. And uh, I, w- I got to know your brother very, very well, and he was a heck of a mentor. Yep. So I appreciate the whole thing. This epigenetics is very fascinating. My question is, we had Jeff Dahl do a producer meeting for us here just a couple months ago, and Dr. Dahl talked about this heat stress thing in some detail, and then the weight loss thing in a little less detail. My question comes from a transition standpoint. We still have in this country, I consider just too much transition cow disease, whether it's metritis, dose of DA, blah, blah, blah. That's going to reap some effects on epigenetics as well. Let me, let me start at that with the transition cow disease. We do have too much transition cow disease. We think we can manage that, but I think really the long-term solution to that is genetics, is that we we need to be looking how to breed cows that don't have that big transition loss in body weight and still produce 
Uh, lots of milk. One of the trends we see is an increase in protein and an increase in fat, which is what we really need in the industry to produce products. So maybe we can stop putting as much focus on volume and put more focus on components and uh, accomplish that goal. You mean, we had a discussion or question there about uh, heat stress. Can you talk a little bit about how heat stress derails the mammary gland development? Absolutely. So I didn't show too much of that data today because I didn't want to overwhelm everybody. But uh, we see that heat stress during gestation, late gestation, really derails the, the epithelial cell component of the parenchyma tissue. We see less epithelial structures there that are going to become the future secretory cells. We also see less uh, parenchyma, not only the parenchyma, but also the fat pad, which is really the support of that uh, epithelial structure as the mammary gland develops, it's going to grow into that fat pad. So if you have less fat pad to begin with, then you're going to have a problem. And I think those early life developmental stages, we don't tend to think a lot about. And as I said today in my presentation, we start thinking about that heifer when she's reached puberty, and then we start thinking about her mammary gland. But I think there's a lot of focus shifting now into those early life developmental stages and even nutrition during the pre-weaning period really impacting mammary growth. And I think heat stress is, is one of those stressors that can really derail development and we see consequences in multiple lactations. So those early life developmental windows are really important and we have to start thinking about them more. So, hey, Jimena, if I could just... Yep ask you a question. So we know that the placenta is disrupted by heat stress. We know that the placenta has a big role in development of the mammary gland of the pregnant cow. Do you think those placental hormones that are regulating mammary development in the pregnant female are having any effect on mammary development in the fetus, or are there really other causes besides that for the that's a great question. I think uh, the impairment in the placental development, it's obviously impacting the calf as a whole, right? Uh, less nutrients, less oxygen, less, less er everything. Um, I think the placental development has a direct impact on the cow mammary gland, and that has been shown, you know, the in connection between placenta, placental function and mammary development of the, the cow. Um, so I, I do think that there's an impact there. I do not know, and I think it will be really a nice um, segue to study, is how the uh, placental dysfunction impact the mammary gland of the offspring directly. Maybe, um, you know, less estrogen, less progesterone at that early life stage might have an impact. I'm pretty sure that it will. Um, but showing that connection, direct connection, it's quite challenging. Um, but yeah, we do see that placental function is impacted, placenta development is, is impacted. We see the cotyledons that are all deformed and, and you know, we're talking about 46 to 60 days uh, having a huge impact on the placenta, the calf and the cow. So it's, it's, it's a lot going on at that time. So that's a great question. Hey, Matt, I want to follow up uh, with a question. You, you mentioned that the circulating IgG levels were lower in these calves that were born to the heat stress dams. Yeah. Why do you think that's occurring? I think uh, our hypothesis is that the, um, the gut has a lot to do with it. The, the development of the gut in utero starts a little bit earlier in, in utero heat stress calves. And so those cells start dying. And so there's kind of like an early um, IgG absorption event occurring. And so once they are born, they have uh, less cells in the gut that are actually proliferating and uh, uh, instead are dying. So gut closure starts a little bit before. So we have shown that there are more cells dying in the gut uh, in those in utero heat stress calves, and so they have less ability to acquire those immunoglobulins from colostrum. So if you give them the same colostrum, the same amount of IgG in the colostrum, they absorb 20% less. So 
I think in utero heat stress is somehow accelerating that gut closure and, and, and that's why they have that. And it's not just at birth, it's throughout the pre-winning period that they have lower IgG, so there's, it's, it's, it's a long-term effect. You may not feel like we're picking on you. But, I, I, I need a drink. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's an expert. She's done this before. I, I, I want to ask Pete, uh, talk about heat stress. Do, do you think we should be breeding cows that are more heat tolerant? Yeah, well, for sure. You know, it's a little bit difficult to do in the United States, I think, because there's so much movement of cattle across the country. So like in Florida, for example, probably a third of the replacement heifers come from outside the state. So it, it, it's difficult to select cattle genetically for resistance to heat stress. But I think in other parts of the world where that would not be an issue, I mean, it's clear that there's genetic regulation of resistance to heat stress, both in terms of ability of the cow to regulate her body temperature during heat stress, but then also in how the cells respond to hyperthermia. So I think, yeah, I think we can, you know, not only can we select for genetic resistance to heat stress, I think you're going to see... Um, genetic estimates of thermal tolerance be start to put out by all the major um, dairy cattle breeding organizations. You're already seeing that in Australia, and I just predict you're going to see that in the U.S. The, the one problem we have is that um, if you just selected for thermal tolerance, you'd select for low milk production because <laughs> high milk production is negatively associated with thermal tolerance. So there's probably some genes that make animals thermal tolerant because they produce less milk, so you don't want to select for those. But there's other genes that are probably independent of regulation of milk yield that we can select for. Kind of like reproduction, right? There's a negative genetic correlation between milk yield and reproduction. But you can find bulls that are very p high for milk yield and high for daughter pregnancy rate. So yeah, I think we're gonna. Yeah, I think it's gonna happen soon, actually. Dr. Hanson, while you have the floor, um, during your presentation today, you talked about uh, the fact that um, uh, DNA methylation around the time of uh, fertilization and then about seven days after. What's the best way, or how can we get methyl donors into the cattle? Uh, at that time frame? Well, I guess you have to buy Reassure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's what makes this whole, that, that, that's what makes us have a conversation about providing methyl donors to ruminants yeah. is the ability to bypass the rumen. Yeah, so no, I appreciate the question, yeah. or the, the answer, but... Uh, well, well I was, was I was, yeah. yeah, I was just teasing there, but, you know, like I was talking to Eric earlier, and I'm sure he'll comment about it. It's a lot easier to provide non-ruminants, like, like women, with choline through the diet than it is uh, ruminant species. But, right. you know, because of the technology we have available. Yeah. I was thinking more around timing, right? So wow. when a cow's bred, she's around, what, 100 days in lactation or so, 120, maybe longer. And we're not typically supplementing choline at that time. And so my question kind of is, how, how, how long do you have to be supplementing either, either choline or methionine ahead of uh, fertilization? If I had to guess, I think you have to supplement it at fertilization. Okay. I'm not sure that... If you feed choline in the transition period, that there's that much choline stored in the body stores 70 days later to be able to influence uh, choline concentrations in the reproductive tract. You know, the same is true for methionine, where, I mean, free methionine probably disappears within a couple of hours after feeding, gets incorporated into tissues as amino acids. So, my, you know, it's an issue in terms of making the feeding of methyl donors practical for altering uh, properties of the calf. So I guess what we have to figure out is, you know, what is the cost of feeding the choline versus the benefit that results from whatever the 
changed phenotype is in the calf. What if we what if we put it in the semen? Ooh. Yeah, I think about that all the time. <laughs> you know, there, there's like I study a lot of molecules that regulate the early embryo, but to inject those in a cow is really expensive, and because you, you're trying to influence the concentrations in the reproductive tract, you know, which might weigh what ten kilograms, but you got to put it in a five hundred kilogram animal to do that. So you got to administer huge doses and and of course every time you touch the animal that costs money so if you could develop a delivery system in semen that would cause slow release of choline or other bioactive molecules that would be great and I, I'm not I don't know anybody doing that right now but I think we put anim we put antibiotics in now. That's so, right. So we have other in ingredients yeah. other than just sperm. But so. when we put antibiotic in, we want it to last 24 hours. Yeah. If we're going to put choline in, or let's say IGF-1 or growth hormone, we want it to last seven days. Sure. Right. The embryo doesn't even enter the uterus until day four, day five. So we have to come up with a slow release method. And, you know, there's been a lot of, I'm not a pharmacologist, but I just heard a seminar on Thursday about uh, slow release, uh, release of vaccine products. You know, there's a lot of pharmacology been developed to achieve slow release of molecules according to the way that you want to achieve the increase and decrease. So I, I think, yeah, there's some opportunity there that we should really be looking at. If you look um, at a moderately analogous situation, if you consider human nutrition requirements or for methyl donors during pregnancy or pre-pregnancy, the classic example that you're going to get is around folic acid for the prevention of neural tube defects, right? So if you look at the public health recommendations for that, generally falls in that women should start taking folic acid supplements about three months prior to conception, right? Reason being twofold, one is behavioral, one is physiological, one being that it takes some time for folate status, or methyl donor status in this case, uh, to increase, right? So hence the three months. And second is because women generally don't know that they're pregnant for the first month or so of pregnancy, and at that point the neural tube is generally already closed around like day 28. So if you take that lesson, I guess if I may hazard a guess into the dairy nutrition world, of which I've got about five hours of exposure <laughs> to so and I'm standing on stage, so I feel like I've made it. But um, if you take that lesson, I would argue that if you take the lesson from human nutrition, it would be that having adequate nutrient supply from the moment of conception on is probably best practice. Whether that's technically feasible, and I'm sure there's a lot of logistics that I'm, I'm not appreciating, I'm sure, but but I would argue that would probably be best practice in a perfect world from a solely epigenetic perspective. Yeah, thank you for that, Eric. Why don't you give uh, the audience, uh, at least the ones that weren't here today, kind of just a real brief overview of what you talked about today and why in the world is a, a human uh, dietitian on a dairy nutrition panel? To get a, non, a lot of non-human dietitians giving uh, <laughs> speeches on stage? Um, no, so my talk was a lot about, uh, about the role of choline in human prenatal nutrition, specifically around uh, adjusting cognition in the offspring. So we have, um, at Balchem, we've sponsored a lot of trials on women who have supplemented with choline during pregnancy, and we've demonstrated that there are significant benefits for offspring cognition uh, as early as uh, 4 to 13 months of age, and that lasts all the way up to, thir or up to age 7. Um, so a lot of really interesting stuff going on around this really critical window of time when nutritional impacts are very strong. Hmm. Very interesting. So how, how different were the differences, right? I mean, I, I saw the graphs, but I, I didn't know, uh, how do you measure that? Were they, were they compelling? I guess that would be a word I, would, I would, would describe it as, or were they marginally compelling? No, so in infants, uh, you did see a significant difference in uh, what they measured effectively was a reaction time test. And so you do see some significant differences there. Now, on a clinical perspective, I mean, it's always difficult to try and assume how that might translate in terms of infant behavior because that's such a, a, a subtle finding in a sense. But at the same time, these small differences that are set up 
can have associations with behavior later in life that are more measurable and more practical to see. I mean, when you look at epidemiological data, you do see so that there's a significant difference that persists um, with the association of choline intake from mom and visuospatial memory in the offspring. And then even our own data shows that the impact of supplementation causally did increase the ability to maintain the child's attention over time, which children are not known for their ability to pay attention on one thing for any given period of time, right? Mm -hmm. So I would argue that's a pretty significant finding. And as I've mentioned before, I mean, my own speculation tacking onto that would be when you consider the competing demands for our attention in our increasingly digital age, I do think that's an endpoint or a finding that is going to have a lot more value going forward. Mm -hmm. Dr. Simmons shared some uh, data uh, earlier that uh, when we supplemented uh, dairy cattle uh, prenatally with, with choline, that the calves uh, had um, higher immune function and they grew faster. Have, have you looked at any of that in humans? Not necessarily immune function, not for, um, uh, not for choline anyway. Um, if you consider the growth of, if you consider the growth of the function of the brain improving with choline supplementation, and by extension that means there must be some biological change that's occurred, right, be it epigenetic or genetic or physiological or what have you, I would argue that yeah, there must be, logically you would assume that there's some kind of a change in growth and development that's occurred as a function of uh, choline supplementation just by virtue of the fact that you see these effects cognitively in, in the offspring. I'm always shocked it takes us so long to do these developmental programming experiments in cattle. I mean, you know, nine months for the gestation, one year for the calf to grow up, nine months gestation for the calf, and then its lactation. But that's nothing compared to studies on the human, right? You would have to really take those children into at least the teenage years or adulthood and I'm sure it'll happen mm -hmm. to really understand the long-term consequences of these benefits of choline early right. in life. And I think to add to that, I, I think we have a very very powerful tool in our hands with dairy because if you think about human studies, then once that baby is born, they are going to be exposed to you know, different diets, different if they breastfeed or not. You know, there's a more heterogeneous environment for them, whereas in cattle we have a very homogeneous progression of events, especially nutrition and management. There, most of them are in the same facility for years, and so and we milk them whether they like it or not. You know, when they become cows, so we have a more homogeneous phenotype. I think so. That's why I think we have a good case in our hands. I used to work with a guy who studied puberty and sturgeon. It takes the sturgeon 25 years to reach puberty, so he said not a good project for a master's <laughs> student. <laughs> so that is a, a limitation, right, on everything we do. It takes a long time. And lots of money, to too. mouse and rat studies. <laughs> takes a long time to study the adults. So, Eric, what, what are the current recommendations for choline supplementation? Um, in humans during gestation and lactation? So the current guidelines are really to follow the adequate intake uh, for choline for pregnant women, which is uh, just over 400 milligrams a day. Um, there's, although that's kind of the, the general sort of state of the art, I guess, from the Institute of Medicine, that's somewhat of a dated recommendation. What you do see, however, is that most women do not meet that, uh, that adequate intake requirement. So there are some statements from some major authoritative bodies within the field of nutrition, the dietary guidelines, uh, the American Medical Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, etc. cetera. Um, and they do um, advocate trying to meet that requirement for choline. Now, certain academics, of course, uh, will have their own opinions about what the specific DRI should be in, in the light of some growing evidence, but nevertheless, right now, um, the AI is sort of the magic number to hit, uh, but even that is still a challenge. Very well. I think we have a question in the audience. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who this question would go to, but basically, what you were saying um, early in the presentations was that methylation of genes can have a uh, down-regulating effect. Is there a known upside to that as far as the survivability of that animal, say in a wild environment where mother happens to go through stress? 
you know, there is for sure. I mean, silencing a gene is not always bad. I mean, most of your genes are probably, not most, I don't know how many in the given tissue, many of them are silenced. So, I mean, there's genes that are probably active in all cells, and then genes that are active just in specific cells or tissues, and then genes that are periodically turned on or off, like, you know, the LH gene for during control of the ester cycle. So, turning a gene off by itself is not bad. And, and you know, we don't completely understand what we're talking about, so, but inappropriate activation or inappropriate silencing, that becomes bad. So I guess my question was, in these situations where the dam is under heat stress, and you look at the pattern maybe of methylation, do you see, is it, is it kind of random? Or is there, could a person say, well, I see how that would help that calf if they were living in a wild, so it's not gonna help the producer in milk, but it might right. be helpful. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I showed a handful of genes just to, to give an overview, but it's a lot more complex than that. And we have uh, methylation in the promoter, which is what we're more used to see. Okay, if it's methylated in the promoter, it's going to be silenced. But we have methylation all over the genome that we certainly don't understand uh, what that does. Um, and we have methylation in, in introns, um, and there's a lot more research coming from the human side showing that methylation, even in introns, is quite important in regulating uh, gene expression. And so it is a lot more complex, and uh, some of the genes that I showed are methylated in the promoters, um, and so therefore we, we assume that they are gonna be silenced, but obviously we have to show that and we have to prove that, and we have to see what are the effects. We show phenotypes that relate to something bad, you know, um, so that heat stress, um, silencing some genes, exerting a negative phenotype, because every, everything I showed is could be considered negative, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's a lot more complex, and this panel can really talk more about that, but um, methylation not only in the promoters exist, and, do we know, is it one cytosine, two cytosines, three cytosines that needs to be methylated to, to see an effect? And so I just want to bring that to the table that we, we certainly don't understand a whole lot on what direction do we go with this methylation. So, I mean, the father of this field is Sir David Barker, also from University of Southampton. And he studied all these children who were fetuses during the winter in 1944 in Holland, and so their mothers were starving, and when they became adults, they had all sorts of increased disease incidents, increased, especially metabolic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So his thinking, which I think really dominates the field today, is that all this developmental reprogramming, all the epigenetic reprogramming, is designed to prepare the fetus for the life it's going to experience after it's born. So maybe it, it thinks, oh, I'm going to be in a really hot environment. I have to turn these genes on and these genes off. And then when it's born, it's in an environment where the producer <laughs> wants it to produce as much milk as possible. And, you know, I think there's some of that in developmental programming, that it is not a error it is uh, adaptation. It's just that when we try to fit it in the production system, it, it becomes um, undesirable. There are different theories, yeah. um, different names, silver spoon hypothesis, thrifty phenotype hypothesis, that depending on what the environment was in utero, whether that's gonna help out or it's gonna become a negative uh, fitness adaptation to the animal, so yeah. I guess my last part of that question is, do you, is there anybody who's looked at whether it affects genetic recombination? Because if you, it seems like if you methylate DNA, it might affect, like, have an effect on how that crossing over and all that stuff uh, happens later on. That's, yeah, that's a very good question. You know, as far as I know, like, recombination rate in cattle has only been measured a few times. I mean, there has not been a lot of 
you know, probably 10 to 20 crossing events, crossover events during meiosis, so it's not that many. But, I mean, your point is, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating one. Because, yeah, that's a very good idea. Great discussion. Eric, during your presentation, <clears throat> you were talking a little bit about um, how choline helps with uh, the transport of DHA. I don't know if that's exactly the right term, uh, term but I, I, I was intrigued by that, and I was wondering if, you know, in, in dairy nutrition, we're doing a lot of work now on very specific fatty acids and the impact that they can have um, on, on biology. And I found myself thinking, boy, it would be great to have, a, you know, a fat um, guy on the panel, but we, we don't have one of those. And so I just, we you might. have one right here. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Not here. <laughs> Our mothers took very good care of us when we were people. <laughs> well, I was actually kind of thinking of Dr. Palmquist out there. <laughs> and I was going, is it all right if I call a friend? Let, let um, me tell you, my mother, my mother did not know I was going to be born. She, she, did, one? she did not know, and the doctor didn't know, did not know that she had twins. And this was before any of the technology. And so after the doctor had checked my brother out to make sure that he was okay, and checked my mom out, he said, I need to check you out. And he said, oh, my God, there's another one in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> this one's going to be trouble. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I just kind of expound on the question. I'm just curious if, if you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, uh, of work, and I'm just curious if Dr. Pomquist has any, any thoughts on that and yeah. choline helping with the transport of other fatty acids and what impact that might have on the cow biology. Uh, sorry to put you on the, on the spot there, Doc. Um, since you ask, um, I haven't looked at choline metabolism specifically. But we did look to see what happens with increasing amount of feeding fat, and as you do that, you increase the phospholipids in the blood a lot. Um, a question I could ask is, could we stress the cow out for choline or methyl donor supply by feeding too much fat? Um, and the other is, by feeding fat, do we provide enough choline to not be an issue? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I don't know that we've come at it from the angle of if we adjust dietary fat, what does that do to choline requirements other than, I guess, the natural experiment of looking at depletion repletion studies in humans, which are not known for having low-fat diets, generally speaking. So when you look at the folks who, even under replete, quote unquote, replete conditions where they're getting the adequate intake of choline, some still do have liver dysfunction, which would suggest to your point that they just don't have enough choline to meet their requirement. Now, whether that's some genetic condition or if that's just a function of excessive fat intake, I don't know if that study or those depletion depletion studies were necessarily built to accommodate that question because they were relatively small, but I do think that's an interesting idea, right? Is it a supplier demand problem or is it just something in the architecture of us? as the way we were built. So I think that's that's an interesting approach. Clay, we haven't had a chance to talk to you much today. Why don't you give us kind of an overview of your presentation? Yeah, so so my my presentation was about the uh the effects of maternal supplementation of choline on, on the calf. And uh we've run a series of experiments at the University of Florida showing uh positive benefits uh, primarily in utero benefits that are occurring in the calves born uh, to dams that are supplemented with choline during the last three weeks of gestation. We've seen improved average daily gain out through out through 10 months of age and, and actually all, all the way to fir uh, out to first calving um, in heifer calves and uh, there was a study run with bull calves uh, submitting them to an LPS challenge at 21 days of age and showing improvements there as well in outcomes and average daily gain um, after LPS uh, supplementation. So, so most of those benefits that we've seen, they are occurring in utero those last three weeks. There are uh, we've seen a little bit of improvement uh, in some of the work um, that have come from um, 
from the colostrum side of things, um, from the colostrum produced from these uh, re reassure supplemented dams. Clay, uh, in, in the transition period, particularly the last three weeks, you know, feed intake drops tremendously, gets really low in the last week or so. Do we need to be changing the supplements that we put in the dry cow feed for the every week for the for the three weeks before a calving? It's a great question. Um, we don't manage the cows that way. No, typically we right? could. We could. It's a really good question. Um, I would say overall, I don't. I don't think we see as much of a decline in dry matter intake as we did maybe 30 years ago in in, in these uh, close-up dry cows. There, there's still a some, some intake depression, but I don't think it's quite as dramatic as what we used to see. Maybe we I, just increased choline for the three weeks before, in the, in the last three weeks of the dry period. Right. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. It's, a, it's a great question. You might want to kick it back over to... Um, Jimena, um, in keeping with our, our, uh, our theme here, how long or how many generations does heat stress impact uh, the dairy cattle? As far as we can tell, um, three generations. Three. If, we, if you use Dr. Reed's, um, you know, classification, but I, I, I refer to it as F0, F1, and F2, so the dam, the daughter, and the granddaughter. So those are three generations. Um, and it comes down to what he stated in the um, opening today, uh, that during that time, we have those three generations that were impacting. So that's why we see down the road those effects, because you, are, you have them all at the same time in those last 60 days. So, Have you done research beyond that? I have. Uh, so actually, when I moved from Florida to Wisconsin, I took 40 heifers, 40 F1s that were generated in Florida. Um, so I put them in a truck, <laughs> took them to Wisconsin, and they are pregnant now. So we are generating the F2, and we are actually going to be able to track the phenotypes, because the data we have is retrospective data, uh, 10 years worth of studies that we could gather 50 animals, 50 F2s, so now we're going to be able to get our hands dirty and get some data, molecular data and phenotypic data on those. But what's striking is that we really still see differences in their growth and um, purity attainment and um, it, even after taking them all across the country, right, and different environments, obviously. And so you still see those differences, so that really makes us think that what happens in utero during that time really stays with the animal regardless of the environment. So that was, it's one of the concerns, right? Like you're changing the environment postnatally so that can wipe off those differences, but really it doesn't look like it. So it's really interesting. I'm very curious to see what we get with these F2s mm. soon. It'll be interesting. So, stay, stay tuned. <laughs> so Jimena, you, you were showing a, a milk production graph from the, from the F2 generation? Yep. And it looks like, if I remember that graph right, about 15 weeks into lactation, they really they start crash. to separate. Yeah. Why do you think that's happening at 15 weeks in lactation? I have no idea. That's a great question. I, I think it, it does impact the mammary epithelial cell turnover, right? So, um, but I, I, I'm just speculating there. I, I don't know. I, I wish now with these F2s that I can get you know, liver bi uh, mammary biopsies and really answer that question. But I do think that it's impacting the ability of those cells to proliferate. And that's when you see that crash, that persistency really um, affected. They reach the peak and then they just crash. So, so I mean, you get effects of heat stress that extend into, uh, you know, transgenerationally. So can we reprogram <laughs> That animal is it doomed forever because it was not because it was exposed to heat stress in utero, or can we reverse that programming? That's a million dollar question. So if you find the answer, let me know. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> for a million dollars, um, I, I think I think we could, uh, and we we have started to 
bounce some ideas and we, we did a couple of experiments there. Um, the first thing we did was uh, to cool the heifers that were born to heat stress cows, right? Uh, dry cows. So we provided the opposite environment to those and say, okay, if, if you cool them once they uh, are born, it's going to be okay. They will just recover. But we didn't see that. Actually, we see uh, that they don't recover. They do respond to the cooling treatment uh, physiologically, so they, they, they respond to that, respiration rates and temperatures, but the growth that um, the, the body growth is not recovered. So even at weaning, we still see that difference right there. Um, obviously, we can improve the cooling methods. Uh, we can try different nutritional um, interventions, so we're, we're starting to work on that. but. It seems like it's 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 difficult, but it's we have to keep trying, right? But I think that uh, those effects that we see long term, they are gonna be there, but we just have to find how to wipe them out. <laughs> so there's a ten percent reduction in birth weight, mm -hmm. and and there's calves that are born to the heat stress dams. How much of that is due to the five days shorter gestation? That's another million dollar question. <laughs> I'm going to get rich today. Um, I think five days, it's, it's pretty uh, significant for growth. Um, I've seen work in pigs that they are uh, inducing uh, parturition uh, at different times, and they see how the, the growth of the piglet is impacted by that. I have not seen that work in cattle, and it's it's quite difficult to to do that to really prove that you know those five days are are not uh, driving uh, the differences that we see. Um, but yeah, I, I I have no <laughs> I don't have a firm answer to that if if that's really a big deal. But if anyone has any thoughts, would be interesting. Uh, thinking about, I guess, both of your respective presentations, I mean, you had talked about uh, Randy Jirtle's work on that at Booty Mouse, right? And they showed that the, the effect of epigenetic insult, which is the BPA exposure, was effectively rescued with methyl donor supplementation. And then you look at your work and you showed that uh, heat stress led to a lot of different uh, methylation abnormalities and things like wind signaling pathways, right, which are known to be impacted by uh, methyl donor restriction, right? So. It seems like at least maybe a you know a shot in the dark perhaps would be that perhaps there's an opportunity to try and at least rescue or perhaps minimize that phenotype with sufficient methyl donor exposure during uh, the gestational period. Absolutely, yeah, I you think know. that's totally doable. I will have some data for you in a few months. Oh, you're fast. <laughs> <laughs> Currently working on that, but yeah, I mean. The, the, the thing with this is that when you impact methylation, you don't know what direction it's going to go. And, and so what we have is the phenotypes, and then we look back at what genes are methylated. So I, I think we have to try and see what happens. But I, I don't have a firm hypothesis of it's going to impact this or this gene. I wish we could do that. Um, but I don't think we're at the point where we can yet. <laughs> what happens in a room and if you have non-protected methyl donors, is, is, is the bacteria just chop those up and use them for something else? Yeah, for, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, there's only, so in the case of choline, Rich Erdman did that work back in the late 1980s and all, all, only about one percent, one to two percent of it <laughs> makes it through the rumen intact. Yeah. Does that change the? I mean, where, where do where does choline come from in a cow that's not getting reassured? I mean, it's synthesizing choline, but probably is it getting bacterial choline? And if you feed choline to the rumen microorganisms, do you increase their incorporation of choline and get more choline from the the bugs themselves? I I, I don't know, but. I don't know what the metabolism of choline is. Well, yeah, they're, digi they're, they're digested downstream, so if you could get more into the microorganisms, maybe you'd also get it. Yeah, there's some more work being done on that area right now, but yeah. Very well. 
Carrie, do we have a question in the audience? So, um, I'd like to explore a little bit about your um, the Brit hypothesis and how it connects into this discussion. So, if I remember the hypothesis correctly, the recruitment of the primordial follicle or or oocyte was, a, a, I think you said, 110 days in your yeah. So if we if we put methyl donors into the animal at the time of recruitment of that primordial follicle, are we influencing it then? Or are we looking at a later time frame for that influence? You know, that's that that's a very good question. Um, just as a as a basic uh, acknowledgement. All of the follicles or all the eggs that a cow will ever have occur when she's a fetus. I mean, it reaches a maximum of maybe when she's in the six month of pregnancy and starts going down from then on. Uh, so those resting oocytes or resting follicles, if you will, are activated and we don't really know why. Why do we have some activated and some not activated? You know, we've got, we've got two or three cycles of activated follicles every three weeks or every week and um, I think the methylation is really associated with once the oocyte reaches the stage of ovulation now it can it, it can be damaged during that development and maybe if we backed up if we just fed higher levels or had had our higher levels of choline the, the whole time it developed but it takes about a hundred and a hundred days 110 days and that that's kind of similar among several species not mice but but larger species uh, so um, I, I think the critical period is just at or during fertilization and its first five or six days of development is as Peter has mentioned that that's the critical period I have a comment on, on that because we, we, we say, you know, the effects on the second, on the F2s are due to the potential, of, uh, talking about heat stress, but impacting that resting oocyte that will become the, the F2, right, the second generation. But during fertilization, you both talk about that those effects are wiped off, those epigenetic marks. Most. <laughs> so that's, that's my question. Um, are some of them immune to that wiping off uh, so that's the only explanation i see on why we see um, those effects in in the granddaughters you know there's a few genes the imprinted genes where only the father's copy or the mother's copy is expressed so even though you inherit copy from daddy and copy from mommy depending on the gene only the father's copy or the mother's copy is expressed so the epigenetic mark that, let's say, silences the father's copy, that gets inherited. So um, there, it's not a complete erasure. And, you know, for I showed those large calves. A lot of people think those are imprinted genes that are being dysregulated. So there, there is some inheritance it's not really well understood is it all just the imprinted genes or is it other genes but it's not com the only time it's completely wiped off is in the primordial germ cell which is the you know when jack talks about the fetus has an ovary or the fetus has a testes those primordial germ cells before they become oocytes, before they become sperm, they have all their marks wiped off. And that, and that's the, the only time when that happens. In the cow, that's about the uh, fifth month of pregnancy. When, fe yeah. when the fetus is about five months old, it'll have a maximum number of uh, germ cells. Dr. Hansen, for the audience that wasn't here, can you talk a little bit more about those large calves? It's it's not necessarily a good thing, right? It's a it's a very bad thing. Yeah, it, it's a so, so I do IVF, right? And so we produce embryos in vitro in a very artificial environment. We, we provide all the salt, sugars, 
amino acids. They're living on plastic instead of in an oviduct and uterus. And amazingly, usually the off, I mean, I shouldn't say usually, many of the embryos that are formed from that um, can establish pregnancy a little bit lower rate than uh, for embryos produced in the cow and and develop normally and produce normal offspring. But maybe 1% of the time, um, fetal development is greatly disrupted, especially development of the skeletal muscles, probably the, the skeleton. And you get this large offspring syndrome, it's called, or abnormal offspring syndrome, where the calves are probably about twice the normal size. So, I mean, we, we've had 130-pound centipole calves born this year. You know, huge, twice the size. And um, they're not, that's the most obvious phenotype. They're really big. But they also have other characteristics. You know, their, their four legs are bent. Sometimes they have a very big tongue. And that is uh, reminiscent of a syndrome in humans called prater willi syndrome, where uh, fetal development's abnormal. There's a lot of severe mental retardation associated with that uh, syndrome. But also, the children have you know, really big tongues. And it seems to be an imprinting error that uh, this one imprinting center that controls these genes that cause Prater Willi uh, are abnormally regulated. And that disease is more common in babies, human babies born from IVF. So some people think, I mean, we don't really know. Some people think that what happens with the large offspring syndrome is similar to Prater Willi, that there's some imprinted genes that don't get epigenetically regulated correctly. And it's a IVF problem, in vitro fertilization problem, but Rocio Rivera at University of Missouri, she's really studied this disease. And, you know, she's talked to a lot of veterinary conferences, and now she has veterinarians sending them pictures of large offspring produced by natural mating or produced by artificial insemination. So it's probably like Prater Willi, where it, it's more common in IVF, but it still occurs in the absence of IVF. Probably large offspring syndrome. It's just rare, but it does occur after natural mating or AI. And I'm just guessing that it's an imprinting error. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by Niasure Precision Release Niacin. Niacin is a proven vasodilator for heat stress reduction and a powerful antilipolytic agent for lowering high blood NEFA in transition cows. Protected with Balchem's proprietary encapsulation technology, you can be sure it is being delivered where and when your cows need it. Learn more at balchem.com slash Niasure. We're getting close to the end of our time here. I want to yeah, really close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if you all saw that, the light sid flicker, that is last call. Um, and as part of last call, what I'd like to do is ask each of you to kind of share two things. One is uh, give us an idea of something you learned today from one of your fellow speakers. Uh, and, and then two, give us an idea of something that uh, the nutritionists, veterinarians in the audience today uh, listening as they're driving down the road to the podcast, what can they do uh, what, uh, from things that you guys learned today that they can take home and use at their dairy farms uh, tomorrow? And why don't we start with you, Pete Dunn? Well, I mean, I think what they can use is really what Amina is going to talk about. I mean, Amina probably has the best example of the importance of developmental programming for for. Uh, dairy cattle production. You know, don't heat stress. We always ignore the dry cow, put her out in the middle of nowhere. That's dumb. Make sure those cows are not being exposed to heat stress. So that's your idea. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> so I already knew that. Nothing I talked about will change the management of uh, dairy farms today. 
But I will say the one thing I think we've learned is there's a role for dairy nutrition in developmental programming. We haven't worked it out yet, but I think in the future you're going to see products designed for dairy cattle that not just increase the cow's milk production, but regulate how it develops in utero. So I, I think that's my take-home message. And what did I learn? I really enjoyed your talk, Eric. Um, just to show the, the range of effects of choline and, and probably other molecules like choline, that it can have pretty profound effects on the function of uh, different organ systems and certainly central nervous system for humans is of utmost importance. Um, I, I learned probably more than anybody, I think, uh, since this is my first exposure to the to the dairy nutrition world. But I think what, I, what I've got a greater appreciation for now is just how impactful the role of early life nutrition really is, and that's a, that's not a human specific phenomena. That's something that is, I think, just just conserved across all mammals. Um, and, and I think we're really only scratching the surface with this too. I mean, we all talked, you know, in some way, shape, or form about methylation, but that's only one avenue that epigenetics plays a role. I mean, um, even our own work with choline shows that choline deficiency can lead to aberrant microRNA expression. That's something that is is just I mean, still super new. I mean, microRNAs were only discovered in what, less than 20 years ago. So, I mean, the imagine where we're going to be in 20 years and what the how we'll be able to describe this relationship between nutrition and epigenetics. So, I would say, I mean, if I was to to give some really 10 million foot high advice to a dairy farmer, I would say that um, paying attention to adequate nutrition, be it you know for humans that are working uh, working in your operation or for the dairy cattle that are there is incredibly important and I think that preconception gestation time is probably the most impactful time to pay attention to nutrition at any point in the lifespan. Well said. Clay? So the take homes from mine, um, we, we've known for years now, uh, certainly two buckets of benefits to um, supplementing reassure to transition cows increase milk and milk component yield and improve liver health and overall health outcomes. But the um, the third benefit we're finding now is is impacts on that developing calf. Um, that's happening the last three weeks of gestation. So those are the take homes from mine. As far as as far as what I learned today, um, I as far as Pete's uh, presentation we we do need to figure out how we can uh, properly supplement these methyl donors during during um, the the time of fertilization and conception yeah thank you for that clay Yamena um, I learn a lot too I, I learn a lot about the large offspring syndrome which I think it's fascinating to think that um, methylation can cause that. And, and I think that's really a fascinating topic. I did learn a lot about choline, just other than being a methyl donor, all the things that it can do. So uh, there's there's a lot there. As far as boots on the ground for my research, I think Pete summarized it very well. So thank you for that. Um, I think just looking at the dry cow, and if you know Jeff Dahl, he has been saying this for many years, cool your dry cows, cool your dry cows. I think now we're understanding what the mechanisms are behind all these phenotypes that we see. And I think getting uh, a better idea on, on how these things work will enable us in the future to manipulate them. Uh, and it will take years, you know, we're in, in the midst of understanding how how they work, but Sometimes when we say programming or manipulating, people get a little um, upset, but I, I think those are the things that are going to come in the future. We know the genes, now we know how to, now we need to learn more how to manipulate them uh, to our benefit and to get uh, positive responses. So managing that dry cow, not just, we, we show that cooling can revert all these phenotypes that I showed but also nutrition uh, or a combination of both, which maybe it's not one thing or the other, maybe it's the two of them. And so 
Yeah, just looking at your dry cows and those three generations that you are impacting. So next time you think about a dry cow, think about three generations and hopefully you don't forget about that. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I would say in 20 years we will have a net merit for epigenetics, just like we have a net merit for genetics for our, uh, all of our breeds of cattle uh, and other species. And, and I also learned how important a simple compound like a methyl group can have a huge influence on the biology of the animal. I think that's an important that we look at all, all the big things, but we also need to look at the little things. Methyl groups are extremely important. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, guys, ladies, this has been a treat. Uh, you know, the, the, real sci the inspiration for the Real Science Exchange has been conversations just like this that I've been a uh, participant of over the many years, whether it's been at the Tri-State, the Cornell Nutrition Conference, ADSA, uh, it's, it's met all my expectations. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you, uh, you guys, for, uh, for participating today. I want to thank the organizers of the Tri-State Conference, one of the best there is out there. I also want to thank our loyal listeners. Uh, we really appreciate you. We appreciate uh, all the kind comments that you, you give us. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Mm -hmm.